Yesterday, we told you about an upcoming visit to China. U.S. Treasury Chief Janet Yellen is going to Beijing to manage the relationship and calm down tensions. But today, we can tell you that ties are unraveling further. This story is about the U.S.-China chip war. Semiconductors or chips are the oil of the 21st century, and whoever controls them will control the world. So it's no surprise that these countries are battling over chips. And it's been on for a while. America drew the first blood. It restricted chip exports to China, and now Beijing has struck back. Today, China imposed curbs on some raw materials. We're talking about the likes of gallium and germanium. These are two rare elements. They're essential in manufacturing semiconductors, and China is curbing their export. So going forward, exporters will have to take special permission from the state to ship them out. What I want to say is that China has always been committed to maintaining the security and stability of the global production and supply chain and has always implemented fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory export control measures and it does not target any specific country. That was the Chinese foreign ministry. They say the ban is not to target a particular country but no one's buying that. The target of this ban is quite clear as is China's strategy. You see, gallium and germanium are crucial raw materials. They're used in everything from chips to solar panels, and they're on Europe's list of critical raw materials, meaning they're essential for Europe's economy. And China is the world's largest producer of gallium. It is also a leading germanium producer. And now Beijing is pulling the strings. What does this mean for the chip industry? And this is a truly global industry, because remember, chips are not produced in any one country. This is a truly global supply chain designed in the U.S., manufactured in East Asia and assembled in China. The machines come from the Netherlands. So U.S., Europe, Asia and China, everyone gets a slice of the action. This also makes it a chaotic supply chain. Last week, the Netherlands restricted exports of some semiconductor equipment. It angered China. This week, China has curbed exports. And now the West is worried. Basically, everyone is relying on everyone else and the constant curbs are not helping anyone. So where does this leave the chip industry? I come back to the question. Until now, Washington has been leading this race. It is the chip design hub, and that gives America an edge. But China has now played its ultimate trump card. Critical raw materials, gallium and germanium. The U.S. depends on China for these. In 2021, America imported over 50% of these two raw materials from China. So Beijing may use this as a bargaining chip during Yellen's visit, maybe for some concessions. Also remember, the Americans have some alternatives. There are other producers, like the UK, Germany and Belgium, which brings us to another question. Will there be more curbs? Well, most likely, yes. Both sides are escalating this conflict, and they know that curbs are a double-edged sword. China may dominate the rare earths market. It may have all the raw materials, but curbing exports will affect its market dominance. So how long can they play this game? From the looks of it, it has just begun. It's July already. We are into the second half of 2023, which means it's summit season. Most organizations will soon host their flagship gatherings like the NATO, the BRICS, the G20, the United Nations General Assembly. All of them will convene soon. But kicking off the summit season is the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. India took over as SCO president last year. So New Delhi set the agenda and hosted the meetings. Today's summit was a virtual one. China's President Xi Jinping was in attendance, so was Vladimir Putin of Russia, Pakistan's Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi, and the Central Asian Heads of State. Four of them are members of the SCO. Turkmenistan is the only exception. Now you can imagine how complicated this video summit would have been. India has problems with China and Pakistan. Putin is fresh from a rebellion. So naturally, there was a lot to watch out for. Prime Minister Modi, being the host, kicked off the meeting. His focus was on countering terrorism. Modi called out states which used terror as a state policy. He did not take names, but I guess he didn't have to. Listen to what he said. Koi sankoch nahi karna chahiye. 
Pakistan did get a chance to respond. Shehbaz Sharif said terrorism is a hydra-headed monster. He also said we must fight it with full vigor. Listen to this. The hydra-headed monster of terrorism and extremism, whether committed by individuals, societies, or states, must be fought with full vigor and conviction. Any temptation to use it as a cudgel for diplomatic point scoring must be avoided under all circumstances. I'm surprised he kept a straight face. That hydra-headed monster is Pakistan's own creation. Such grand statements cannot hide that reality. Anyway, next to speak was Russian President Vladimir Putin. He did talk about the recent rebellion by Wagner forces, but he was dismissive about it. He says Russia is more united than ever. I would like to point out that Russia is confidently resisting and will continue to resist external pressure, sanctions and provocations. In the current environment, our country continues to develop steadily. The Russian people are consolidated as never before. Russian political circles and the whole of society clearly demonstrated their unity and elevated sense of responsibility for the fate of the fatherland. That's an assurance from Putin. He basically wanted to say, I'm still in charge. China's President Xi Jinping also got his chance. He had a lot to say about the Belt and Road's 10-year anniversary. He also asked SEO members to chart independent foreign policies. In other words, don't pick the West. That's what China was trying to say. Beyond the statements, the SCO also got some work done. Iran was welcomed as the ninth member. Belarus was given the invitation to join next year. So the SCO is expanding further west. The leaders also signed the New Delhi Declaration. It's basically a joint statement. What does it say? Three major things. One, the SCO is not directed against other countries. There is scope for cooperation. Two, the SCO will avoid ideological or block-based approach to problems. And three, the SCO will never militarize the outer space. But one problem still remains. Dueling priorities. There is no consensus on what each member wants from the SCO, or for that matter, what the SCO is. You see, Beijing wants to create a Chinese club. It wants to use the SCO to dominate and control Eurasia, like a fast track for Xi's Belt and Road Initiative. But Russia wants status quo. It is using the SCO to keep Central Asia balanced. It doesn't want China to take over its backyard. Hence the campaign to give India membership and next year Belarus. All of this means a good deal for Central Asia. Their location is a geographic boon. It can connect West Asia and Europe to Asia. It's got all the makings of a great transit hub. What they need, though, is investments. And at the SCO, there are multiple candidates, which brings us to India. What are India's expectations from this grouping, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization? Countering terror is a major objective, like in Afghanistan, where the SCO is a major stakeholder, or even in Pakistan, where regional groups can build pressure. India has put special emphasis on this. In fact, a separate joint statement on countering radicalism was also signed today. Clearly, it's priority for India. Secondly, the SCO could be a window to Eurasia. New Delhi has its own connectivity projects lined up, like the Chabahar port in Iran or the INSTC, the International North-South Transport Corridor. It's an ambitious 7,000-kilometer project. It aims to connect Europe to India. Prime Minister Modi mentioned both these projects today, but once again, it's a question of dueling priorities. Will SCO members pick the BRI or the North-South Transport Corridor? Will China ever play a positive role in such projects? I think we know the answer, and looks like the Indian government does too. You see, the original plan was to host a two-day in-person SCO summit. Instead, what we got was this, a three-hour virtual one. It doesn't mean India is t tuning out of the SCO. It means India is being realistic about what the potential is. For our next story, let's turn our attention to Japan. It faces the ire of the world and its people alike. I'll tell you why, but first a quick flashback. We're going back to the year 2011. That's when Japan witnessed an earthquake. You may remember it. It was the strongest one in Japan's recorded history. It resulted in a tsunami, killed over 18,000 people along its northeast coast, rendered more than 450,000 people homeless. 
and caused the destruction of the Fukushima Daiichi plant. It's a nuclear power plant in Japan's Fukushima. The tsunami knocked out its power supply. There was no electricity. It led to meltdowns in nuclear reactors. It was the world's worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl in 1986. Almost 12 years have passed since. Radiation levels in the atmosphere have dropped. Damaged reactor buildings have been treated and robots have been put to work to identify melted fuels in basements. But Japan is still battling the disaster's legacy. I'm talking about water. 1.3 million tons of it. Enough to fill 500 Olympic-sized pools. It was used to cool down the damaged reactors. Now it has accumulated in the plant. It fills 1,000 tanks in the complex. And space is running out. So Japan wants to release this water into the sea, but this is extremely controversial because this isn't your everyday all-natural water. This is radioactive wastewater. It has been treated, sure, but it still contains tritium. That's a radioactive material. It's difficult to separate from water, but Japan wants to release it regardless. Gradually dump it into the sea over the span of a few decades. And to the world, this is concerning. The island nation says this water is safe, but many strongly disagree, especially China. China has called for the suspension of this plan. Japan has repeatedly tried to change China's mind about it, to explain its stance to Beijing, but China being China has ignored the offers for a conversation. Who will monitor the discharge that has so much uncertainty for so long? How to monitor it? How to ensure the credibility of monitoring? There is no tangible conclusion to any of these questions. Our request is simple, that is, the Japanese side calls off the ocean discharge plan, earnestly consults with the international community, and jointly explores a scientific, safe and transparent way to deal with the issue that is acceptable to all parties. South Korea is worried too. Guess what they're doing about it? Hoarding excessive amounts of sea salt. There has been a sudden surge in demand and it has risen prices of salt by 27% in just two months. People worry that radioactive materials may contaminate the salt or that salt supply from Japan may reduce, which could increase its price further. So South Koreans are planning ahead and in doing so, they're panic buying. I recently bought five kilograms of salt. As a mother raising two children, I couldn't just sit back and do nothing because I wanted to feed them safely. Once you throw this into the ocean, it becomes irreversible. If problems arise later on, it will be a belated regret. And this anger extends to the Pacific Islands. They're still dealing with the legacy of nuclear weapons testing. This was done by the US, the UK and France in the 1940s. So the Pacific Islands fear additional water contamination and they oppose Japan's plan too. Throwing uh, radioactive water waste in the Pacific Ocean uh, will harm not only the fishes in the ocean, but as well as the people who will be exposed to the radioactive material. And this means that our exposure to radioactive oceans will be continuous and will be uh, passed on to the next generation of uh, young people who will be relying on the oceans for their livelihood. But more than a dampened relationship with neighboring countries, Japan is facing fierce anger within its boundaries. The local fishing communities say the plan will destroy their livelihoods. It's something they've had to rebuild over a decade. They believe consumers will shun their catch, prices will skyrocket, and fishers will go hungry. Those who say nuclear contaminated water is safe, none of them actually work in the fishery business or know what is going on. Those of us in the aquaculture industry all think it's unsafe. Even before the dumping of the nuclear contaminated water, I was affected by it. Everything collapsed in my life. What I'm thinking now is you shouldn't eat any fish at all. Let's see what meat and other alternatives are available. But even so, Japan has one ally, not a country, not its people but a UN watchdog, the International Atomic Energy Agency. This agency says there's nothing wrong with Tokyo's plan to release wastewater. Listen to this. The plan, as it has been uh, proposed and devised, is in conformity with the agreed international standards. And its application, um, if the government decides to proceed with it, would have negligible impact on the environment, meaning 
the water, fish and sediment. Negligible impact on the environment. And we can imagine how happy this would have made Japan because they've been trying their best to make the world believe it. Japan will continue to provide explanations to the Japanese people and to the international community in a sincere manner, based on scientific evidence and with a high level of transparency. So Japan is planning to go ahead with the water release, even though no one seems to be buying their explanation. Countries like China refuse to believe the UN watchdog, much like they don't believe Japan. But the island nation is relentless. It will release a final plan soon after its approval from the regulator. And that should come as early as this week. And after that, it's all hands on deck. All while many wonder if they will soon witness three-eyed fish or a Godzilla origin story. For our next story, let's take a quick look at history. The year was 2002. Attack helicopters were hovering over Jenin. It's a city located in the West Bank. On the ground, a fierce battle was unfolding. Israeli soldiers battled Palestinian militants. Citizens were caught in the gunfire. When the smoke cleared, more than 50 people were dead. It was called the Battle of Jenin. It was Israel's biggest operation in the West Bank during the Second Intifada, or the Second Uprising. Two decades later, it's an eerie deja vu for Jenin. Drones are striking the city's refugee camp. The streets are empty but filled with smoke. The noise of gunfire echoes through the night. On one side, there are Israeli soldiers. On the other, Palestinian militants. And caught in the middle, again, are ordinary residents. There were strikes and bombs. It was like World War III, not even like the First World War, a Third World War. They are attacking unarmed people. They are using planes and rockets. I came yesterday evening to take my sister to my home, but we were stuck. The military vehicles and bulldozers entered the area. This is a criminal enemy. Ten people have been killed, hundreds are injured, many are fleeing the camps. The residents of Jenin are calling it a black day an attack by the so-called occupation. Israel, on the other hand, defends this as a military operation. It says the Jenin camp was a hub of terrorists. There's a direct line between Islamic Jihad activity and Iran, funding capabilities, etc., etc. Uh, talking about how long this will land, how long this will last, it could take hours and it could also take days. We're not here to conquer or hold the ground. When it's finished, we'll be out of there. The operation started on Monday morning. This was when Israel hit an apartment in this refugee camp. Then came the troops. The IDF, or the Israeli forces, even released a few pictures of the raid, including this one of an underground shaft. They say it was used to store explosive devices. Israel has long maintained that this refugee camp was a hub of militant groups, the likes of Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade. The IDF launched a comprehensive action against terrorist strongholds in Jenin. In recent months, Jenin has become a safe haven for terrorists. From that safe haven, terrorists perpetrated savage attacks, murdering Israeli civilians. As I speak, our troops are battling the terrorists with unyielding resolve and fortitude while doing everything, everything to avoid civilian casualties. Palestine, on the other hand, calls this a ruse, an attack on defenseless citizens. It called on other nations for help and protection. We are again calling the international world to provide urgent international protection to our people and impose penalties against the occupation regime. The Arab world has responded to this cry. Jordan, for one, slammed the Israeli aggression. So did Egypt, Turkey and Iran. The U.S. has pleaded for closer cooperation. The United Nations has called for calm. But Israel is defending its actions. What explains this sudden attack on a refugee camp? The city has been a focal point of conflict. There have been raids in the past, too. But they were never this violent. So many are calling it a distraction tactic. They say it's Prime Minister Netanyahu's way to make the world forget about protests at home. You see, Israel has been protesting over judicial reforms, reforms that he wants to bring in. And these are the biggest protests that the Jewish state has seen ever. These protests have entered their 26th week, but Israelis are not backing down. 
So are the Jenin raids just a distraction tactic? Prime Minister Netanyahu has been accused of this before, though, of using violence as a distraction. But where does this lead to? Are Israel and Palestine on the brink of another war? And this too has happened in the past, multiple times, mostly in Gaza. But now it's playing out in Jenin. The city is part of the West Bank. It is controlled by the Palestinian Authority, or PA. They have administrative and security controls over this region. But it looks like the PA has lost control of the Jenin camp and of the situation. There's large-scale violence. It could lead to more conflicts, more militant groups, or more calls for a two-state solution. It's hard to say how this will end. Israel says the operation is almost over. It's only when the dust settles that the world will see the real impact of this raid. Tolerance and patience, they're great virtues to have, but they're not virtues to be exploited. Someone should tell that to the West, especially to the US, Canada and the UK, because the Khalistanis have struck again. Their target, the Indian consulate in San Francisco. This video shows the building on fire. The local fire brigade was deployed to bring it under control. Thankfully, there was no major damage. All the diplomats are also safe. The U.S. State Department has condemned the arson. Their spokesperson says violence against diplomats or their facilities is a criminal offense. But what are they doing about it? The same consulate was attacked in March this year. Khalistanis broke through barricades and gates. They installed Khalistani flags on the building. Washington condemned that incident as well. But months, months later, the threat remains and the actions are repeated. It was a security breach in March. It's arson today. I wonder what's next. How long can Indian diplomats live in fear? How many more Indian consulates have to be attacked for the Western governments to actually do something? The fact is, the US government is dragging its feet. They say they're concerned, but in reality, they aren't doing much. Sunday's incident seems to have been a revenge attack. Revenge for what? The killing of Hardeep Singh Nijar. He was a Khalistani based in Canada. The Indian government had declared him a terrorist. On the 19th of June, he was gunned down in Vancouver. We don't know who the attackers were or what their motive was. But clearly, it has enraged Khalistanis. Nijjar was the chief of the Khalistani Tiger Force. He also worked with Sikhs for Justice. So these organizations are out with a vengeance. The consulate attack could have been one tactic. Another one is planned for the 8th of July a so-called Khalistan Freedom Rally. This is being organized in the US, in Canada, and in Australia. Look at their posters. They say, kill India. They also display the name and picture of the top Indian diplomats in those countries. This is the American poster. Down below, you can see Taranjit Singh Sindhu. He's India's ambassador to the United States of America. These diplomats have been labeled killers of Hardeep Nijar. India has summoned the Canadian envoy in response. It has also lodged a diplomatic protest. Foreign Minister S.J. Shankar once again had a warning for these countries. He said Khalistani thought is not good for relations. Listen to this. We have requested our partner countries like Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia not to give space to the Khalistanis. This will affect our relations. Now Canada is clearly the hotspot. The biggest rally will also probably be in Canada. So what is their government doing about this? The foreign minister says the posters are unacceptable. She also said the safety of Indian diplomats will be guaranteed. So very similar to the US statement. But this problem isn't just about security, is it? Yes, the urgent need is security, but the larger problem is the politics. The likes of Canada see Khalistanis as a security threat to Indian diplomats or to Indian facilities. They don't think it's a threat to themselves or to the Indian Republic. And that's the problem here. You know how Pakistan kept talking about good terrorists? Well, this is no different. Canada's government thinks Khalistanis are a vote bank, hence the reluctance to crack down. India has handled this issue with patience and tolerance so far, but how much longer? Indians living abroad are now feeling unsafe. Indian diplomats are being called killers. So New Delhi must draw the red line somewhere because other governments have. The U.S. invaded other countries to capture wanted terrorists. In the process, they killed thousands of innocents. Why not show the same urgency against terrorists targeting India? Well, because of politics. 
This problem will not disappear just by beefing up security or giving more bodyguards to Indian diplomats. That should be done, yes, but that alone is not enough. You need to target the root of Khalistani separatism and terrorism. You need a broad crackdown to choke this movement, their funding, their groups. But knowing the West, it's not happening soon. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Peru's most active volcano, Ubinas, has reported heavy activity. It shook the region and sent a column of toxic gas into the air. They're set to declare a state of emergency. In Japan, parts of a sea turned an ominous shade of red. This was after a leak at a local beer factory. The supermoon lit up the skies last night. We have images from Latin America where the moon appeared brighter and larger than usual. And finally, what makes the 4th of July significant? It is America's Independence Day. In 1776, the U.S. gained independence from Britain. And speaking of independence, the U.S. shares this day with its colony, the Philippines, which ironically gained freedom from the United States in the year 1946. After 48 years of colonization, we're leaving you with these images. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. In 48 years of American sovereignty, the men and women of the Philippines receive their independence. Reduced to poverty after the Japanese occupation, Manuel Roxas newly elected the office as a new era of prosperity dawns for the gallant people of the Philippines.